this orbiting sphere, it is a sentient, living, moving, conscious thing, and we are not its vital organs. Not the nervous system that we feel like we are. We are not the white blood cell warriors that we want to picture ourselves as. Not, not the lungs, nor the, nor the cage surrounding them. We are certainly not the brain. Not the neurological wiring, not the puddle of dopamine, not the circulatory system, not the thumping, pumping, beating heart of this sphere. But, however, with that having been said, nor are we the viruses that we are so eager to demonize ourselves as. We are not the cancer. We are not the cancer. Well, well, maybe just a little bit cancerous, but we're treatable. We're not the mutation, not, not the birth defect we'd like to hide behind, not the rotting teeth, nor the dental records that we think we're being all the time. This is, this is no orbiting corpse. This is no orbiting corpse. It needn't be saved. Truth be told, we just might be the appendix, <laughs> if not the tonsils. <laughs> Not all stargazers love astrology. Some of them are just in love with a prototype of an astrophysicist. Some of them are just jealous of their hypothetically tender relationships with their telescopes. Something about joint attention. Something about two infants watching the same fallen plastic bowl of mushed carrots at precisely the same instant. Something, something about gravitational momentum, about, about pureed splatter, axis wobbling, something about time, about how people like us share it unwittingly unknowingly, something about the invisible circuitry all around us, the stuff that atoms study under the scrutiny of their microscopic microscopes. Not all liars are dishonest. Some are just in love with the notion of being right. Some are just eager to believe all the sunshine, no matter which galaxy it spills from. In order to avoid having to squint at its glare, something about convenience, about the cost of convenience, about who's going to foot the bill, especially since the tea was too hot and the cup that it came in had no handle and I had no patience left. I'd left it, my, my patience that is, in the pocket of yesterday's pants. It was sprawled out atop a pile of angry laundry. I washed it in a pool of regretful empathy, wrung it out over a bed of spotted tiger lilies, awakening and startling a colony of lone earthworms digging for their lives, squirming through the waning fertility of a naked patch of smushed grass blades that they could, they could have sworn, they could have sworn that it was raining. But the lone mantis, for whom the falling water had interrupted his perpetual prayers, the, the lone mantis who went high-stepping amongst their slithers, told them all in a fit of indignant haste while standing under the refuge of an orange flower petal that those gargantuan rain droplets, those drops of fool's sustenance, that were they, they were lacking the type of nutrients that are usually potentially potently present in, in rainwater. In other words, don't believe everything that your eyes tell your brain that the sky is saying. Not all daydreamers have their heads in the rain cloud. See, some of them are ostriches. Some of them are staring into space, not quite stargazing, not quite telescoping. There is a reason why we all look up. It is our inner mouse scanning the sky for birds of prayer. There is a reason why we all look down. It is our inner North Dakota. It has something to do with where they've buried the nuclear warheads. See, not all nuclear warheads end world wars. Some of them, some of them detonate over the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Some of them end up nothing more than an empty missile casing. See, no one's questioning whether or not the tree has fallen in the forest nor the sound it did or didn't make. We just, we just want to know if it was the result of time 
or, or, or dying roots, or, or termites, or, or the aftermath of a honey-craving grizzly bear's pursuit of sweetness, or the industrious flare of a beaver, or the indifferent winds of a recent hurricane, or an axe, or, or was it a chainsaw? I bet, I bet that I hope, I, I hope that I bet, I bet that I hope that it was a chainsaw. See, suppose that a nuclear warhead explodes over the Atlantic Ocean, and its mushroom cloud dissipates in such a way that to the east of the explosion it would appear to form a black spoke silhouetted image of Allah in the sky. And to the west, a billowing gray cloud in the shape of Jesus on the cross. And, and there's just one, just one lone agnostic leatherback sea turtle surfacing for air long enough to see it lingering in the clouds. Will the hermit crabs have any reason to believe his story? Will the seahorses neigh his claims? Will the stingrays even care? Or will, they, or will they in turn proliferate about the semiotic images that they've seen etched into the ocean floor before? Will the school of angelfish chime in at all, recanting that time that they found that holy coral that looked like the statue of Ganesh? I mean, I mean, is this the sort of thing that angers oceans, that throws them into fits of waves, that brews storms? Thank you.